Okay. So today is Monday, September 8th. You have turned in your homework and you have your notes out and are ready to go. This is European history. I actually have something for each of you. It is something that you people at home will get later. But what it is, is a new chapter survey format. Please take one and pass the rest down. Welcome, take one and pass the rest down. I'll collect the extras from you, sir. Remind me of your name. Last name? Simpkins, okay. So I'll collect the extras for Mr. Simpkins. Uh, so you've all done now, presumably, chapter survey uh, in the style that I normally do it. However, I have made the decision that this year is so full of fun and joy that it requires a special uh, chapter survey. So those of you who are in honors, um, European history, I can't remember the class, uh, and maybe those of you are in AP, I'm still working that out, um, are going to only have to do this. Now, I will explain how this is different from what you just did. Uh, first off, it is a uh, formatted portrait style, which might help you in your writing. It might not. I don't know. You still have matching to do, which is the same as what you've done already. You still have identifying, uh, now, and that's multiple choice. Uh, that is still the same. So 10 questions of matching, 20 questions of multiple choice. Hope you've checked in, you at home. You still have three documents to do. The opposed views, one and two on the left and right. If there's a third opposed views document that goes on the bottom, if not, that third document is from somewhere else in the chapter. I presume that each of you chose some interesting alternative third documents for chapter 12. You'll also notice the vocabulary down below is oddly formatted. It's the only way I could fit it. So, what's the benefit, you say? Well, first of all, you don't have to put things in chronological order. I've scrapped that section. Secondly, flip it, you will note that you only have two essays to do from now on, not three. Uh, now, you should have two essays, but I'm going to give you free choice. I want you to check whether the essay number is from questions for critical thought or analyzing primary source documents. I want you to check that off. There's a little square that you can check that off in. And then I want the essay number. But thesis, rationale, evidence, and significance are all the same. It's instead of three, you only have two. Instead of having to do matching multiple choice and chronology, you only have to do matching and multiple choice. So I have reduced this to what I consider to be the bare essentials for you to get something out of the chapter survey work. You will also note down at the bottom which chapters have maps. Chapter 12 did. I presume that you copied, drew, or scanned the maps and stapled them to the back, although it's to the front's no big deal, of your chapter survey 12. Uh, so this is what's due from now on. I've got a bunch of sheets here, which I'm going to put in that pile to replace, and I will have them online soon. So if you have the old sheets, you can either turn them in if you want, or you can scrap them, use them for kindling, uh, or to line the hamster cage if you have a hamster or a rabbit at home. Any questions about the new format? Does anyone wish to complain that I have reduced your workload? Oh, Mr. Genorio, I want to do more. I want to learn more, and I want to write more. I do. Fine. Okay. I guess I'll have to do it this way. No. Uh, I'm also... I, I don't know if I will do anything more. But uh, this is my effort to recognize the fact that uh, just being here in masks and being at home uh, it, indirectly is an interference to the normal learning process that we have going on. 
So what I'm trying to do is not waste your time. I'm trying to give you the essential work and just the essential work, work that will help you be excellent, but work that will not waste your time. No questions, comments, or thoughts. Okay. For those of you who are disappointed, you can always do extra credit. Uh, let's see. So that's the new format. I'm going to get the dice because we're going to talk about the movie clips that you saw on Friday. By the way, there were people who had trouble getting onto those film clips because of uh, the fact that it was not approved in some, the clips were not approved in some respects. I hope that you figured out that what you do is you sign out of your charter account and just watch them. Regular standard YouTube will allow you to watch those videos. If you haven't yet watched them, do so. If you come up with a technical uh, block, I don't check my email on the weekends because I deserve time off, just like you do. Uh, I checked it this weekend and I answered a few questions, but here's what you can do. In the pub public... In the public comment section, under any assignment that you're having trouble with, including assignments that have linked videos, what you can do is you can say, I'm having a problem with this, and other people might help you. Because someday it may be you uh, that needs the help. If you've solved the problem that somebody else, somebody else has, please put it in the public comment section. That can be a place for you all to discuss the work that you have, and help one another out. That also is a good skill to have. You encounter a problem, you improvise a solution, you adapt yourself to that solution, you overcome the problem. So that's that's what I expect you to do. Uh, was there anyone who... No, I don't want to ask. If for whatever reason you didn't see the clips by now, which I hope you have, uh, you'll do your best to wing it or, or figure it out uh, and see the clips later and get the work done in late. Any questions before we begin? Okay. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Opening scene, The Dawn of Man. Is a scene which is filmed in 1968 when, uh, actually it was filmed in 67, when the year 2001 was far into the future. Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, the writer and the director, posited that we would have a large spinning space habitat with simulated gravity from centripetal force, that we would have a moon base, and uh, that we would have the ability to launch manned probes as far as Jupiter and Saturn. A force, in reality, uh, from 2010 until just about now, the United States didn't even have a manned spacecraft. When we wanted to go to the space station that we largely built, which is called International for Diplomatic Reasons, but it's mostly ours, um, we had to hitch a ride with the bleeping Russians. We don't have a big space station. We have a little one. We certainly don't have a moon base. In fact, nobody's been back since December of 1972. You can take some satisfaction from the fact that the only people on the moon have been American men, but the fact remains, hopefully, at some point, we will realize that space is a useful endeavor and we will go back. Gosh, that would be nice. In any case, there's the 2001 scene, which is set at the dawn of man, and there's the heat scene, which is set around the year 2000 in Los Angeles, and it's based on an actual series of armed bank robberies that ended up in a massive shootout across the city of Los Angeles. That happened. The scenes from Heat that I showed you were of a detective deciding to engage and maybe spook one of his uh, investigatees, and uh, what you saw was the helicopter, the highway, and a cafe. So my first conflict, uh, my first conflict, my first question, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and above as a volunteer, or I re-roll. My first question is, in the 2001 A Space Odyssey scene, was there anything man-made? Was there anything that was crafted artificially? I rolled a natural 20. Does somebody wish to answer that as a volunteer? Yes. Isn't There's the big block that's in the middle of... You are right, but to be clear, 
If you've seen the rest of the story, that's mm -hmm. Alien Maid. Oh, okay, I haven't. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a cheesy answer, but it, it is it is the truth. The the, the beings, the the Australopithecus, uh, Australopithecus, uh, did not make that. That was that was made by non-human hands. So, so that doesn't count. But that that's an obvious answer, and it, and it's a good one. The monolith is what it's called. Um, does anyone have anything to add? Is there anything that's man-made? in the scene 2001 a space odyssey anything at all yeah if you want to get non-physical i mean violence was man-made violence is the state of nature anyone yeah. who thinks that nature is peaceful has lived too hot, long on the apex of the food chain the truth is what's going on to the east of us in the wild mountain lands between here and montana is kill or be killed yeah. first of all there's the winter kill that's coming up which is the frost which is going to kill all sorts of animals uh, some animals will migrate like the birds, some will hibernate like the bears. Um, but in nature, there is no I surrender. That's there's I'll catch you and I'll eat you. Nature is actually incredibly brutal and there is very little comfort. So you can say our propensity for violence, that did change. That's an interesting answer, Mr. Heaton. Um, we'll talk more about that. But I would argue that violence does come from the natural state, which is a state of eat or be eaten or kill or be killed. Still, thoughtful answer. Nothing else. Nothing else that was natural, that was man-made. Okay, we'll let that answer stand for now. Second question, same numbers. Uh, so two, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 to 18. I should have you at home answer it, but I can't get your answers. So, um... In the movie Heat, was there anything that was natural? Anything that was not made by the hand of man? Twelve. That would be you, Miss um, Spodnik. The people. Okay, let's describe the people. What do the two main characters look like? Um, one's a detective and one's a criminal. Okay, one's a detective, one's a criminal. Are they wearing uniforms? They're wearing suits. They're wearing suits. Okay. It is true that the human beings come from a natural process of evolution or they come from God and were made in his image. In any case, the question is, is the way that those human beings are presented at all natural? What is not natural about the way they're presented, Alex? Um, their clothes. Clothes aren't, like... Yeah, they're not running around buck naked, no. number one. Number two... How do their faces look as compared to mine? They're shaved. They're shaved. Here's a secret. Men in a state of nature have beards. They have mustaches. They're not trimmed like my beard. Uh, the hair is not cut, but men have beards. Both of those men in the Roman fashion were clean shaven because in our society that is, that is common. That is, that is typical. So the men do not present natural faces. They are wearing unnatural coverings. What else is uncommon about or unnatural about those men, about the people in that second scene? I'll ask you just because you're front and center. Um, natural or unnatural? I guess they probably had some sort of uh, dentistry done at some point. Yes! Their teeth are not rotting out which, if you don't get dental care, will happen before age 40. And both of those men are in their 40s or 50s. That's another thing. Our natural lifespan, without modern medicine and without the Industrial Revolution to provide material plenty, is maybe 15 to 25 years. That means that half of the people die before age 15 to 25, depending upon the time or place. We are not long-lived creatures in a natural state. Uh, the fact that the average age uh, for men in the United States, I think, is in the high 70s, and for women is in the 80s somewhere, I think, that maybe it's, it's within 10 years, uh, is an indication of two things. One, we have amazingly extended our lifespans thanks to industry and medicine. And two, men die before women do because we have to live with you. Uh, it's a little joke. I'm going to make these jokes from time to time. You can, if you're an angry person who's, oh, he's melted women. Yeah, I'm going to do that. You can insult men. Believe me, we are filled with things uh, to uh, worthy of insult. And I personally, not least, 
uh, and filled with things worthy of insult. So be, be my guest to raise your hand whenever I tweak you, but I'm going to do that because it's fun for me, and I hope it will be fun for you tweaking me back. It's called this humor thing, and in a time where everyone is wearing masks, it's, it's a good thing to have, even if it's a lame joke. So um, I would argue that because of all of those things, the men are unnaturally old, they're unnaturally clean, they have unnaturally straight teeth, and, you know, they're shaved and all the other things, that they have taken the natural form and adapted it in so many unnatural ways relating to civilization that they may be natural. But it's inside a very man-made um, context. What else in that scene might be considered natural? I will roll. What else might be considered natural? This is in the scene in Los, Los Angeles. 19. That asks for a volunteer, but we don't have any. Three! Yes! Um. What would you consider natural? Yes. Um... I'm not really sure what else. Take a guess at describe something that that a, that a person might consider to be normal. Think of the opening scenes, if you will. In in heat, what is the man doing? How is he being transported? He's in a helicopter. So he's flying. Is there anything in the flying scenes that might be considered natural? Certainly not the helicopter, nor the cityscape of Los Angeles, which is filled with electric light. What might be natural in the background? Um, the sky. And what's in the sky at night? The sun or the moon? Well, many suns and possibly the, the moon. Okay, arguably the stars are natural. Yeah, we haven't been there. However, when the moon is shown, I will point out we've been there. There's, there is, there is human relic. There are human relics on the surface of the moon. So even the moon, we haven't, uh, we haven't left uh, pristine. We've been there. But yeah, the stars. Aside from the stars, you might say, well, we saw, we saw the highway. We saw desert. You know, we saw bushes and trees. Everything in Los Angeles is planted. Nothing is natural. I don't know if you've ever been to Southern California. It's like a big garden, and it relies completely on irrigation. What's natural there is scrub desert. That's the natural climate. And I, didn't, I don't think they showed anything. Everything happens at night. That's unnatural. All those lights, that's unnatural. The man's traveling in a helicopter like a Greek or Roman god, like Hermes, flying around with his little slippers. That's not natural. Um, then he's traveling on an automobile. A mile a minute down the highway, 70 plus miles an hour. Shoom, that's not natural either. So what we see in both of these scenes, and pay attention you at home, love to be able to ask you things, is uh, this is the course of history. At the beginning, we have a world that's entirely natural, entirely natural. The club the guy uses at the end to, dis to claim ownership of that well, that's a natural thing. He found it. It's a bone. He didn't even make the tool. He found it and used it. Chimpanzees will do that. They'll wet thin sticks and stick it into termite mounds. Mmm, tasty protein. Uh, we found and used tools. At some point in the state of savagery, somebody did that first. Whether it was an ape man, according to evolutionary theory, or whether it was Adam or Eve, somebody used the first tool. Tool use is a quality of, of human beings. And look at what we have done. We have made an entirely artificial world a world where even we are no longer in our natural state because our natural state is not very pleasant compared to what we're able to build. That's the course of history. This is the before and the after picture. Last question, how does conflict play out in these two stories? How does conflict play out in 2001 A Space Odyssey? We'll start that one. How does conflict play out? Uh, 15, yeah, you're close. Uh, violently and loudly. Yes. That, by the way, is... Really? <laughs> You're quite right, Philip. <laughs> um, yeah. In fact, uh, the conflict early in the scene is not violent at all. Most animals realize there's no medic around. 
So most animals are going to preserve their health because without their health, they're dead. If you're a wounded animal in the wild, you're basically somebody's lunch. So how is the conflict played out at the beginning of the scene? How do the two tribes contend over the only water within 100 miles during the dry season in East Africa? Okay. Yes. Well, they kind of just like yell at each other, yeah. like intimidating. It's threat displays. Yeah. Chimpanzees do this today, and they are genetically the closest thing to us that, that we know of on Earth. Uh, they dance, they say, they, they, they threaten, they, they gesture, and it's, it's like a bully going up to you and going, ee, ee, and you're expected to flinch. So that's what it is. It's threat displays. It's not really physical contact. And then the monolith comes along and zzz, teaches them. And whether the aliens taught us or whether we figured it out ourselves, at some point, somebody gets angry enough or desperate enough to say, I need the water. You're between me and the water. I'm going to kill you. And that's the violence. Uh, whether that's natural or unnatural, you know, it's a science fiction movie. Uh, but at some point, we learn that. We learn the lesson of tool use, we learn the lessons of violence, and that stays with us today. By the way, war. <laughs> good God, y'all, what is it good for? Well, the song from the 60s, which I love, <sighs> says absolutely nothing. Is that, is that true? Is war good for absolutely nothing? Have we just been doing something incredibly stupid and self-defeating since the dawn of man? Because we've waged war since the dawn of man. By the way, so do ants, so do chimpanzees. Jane Goodall in the 90s, to her horror, discovered that tribes of chimps wage war on one another. Ant colonies wage war on each other all the time. There may be others. What is war good for? I'm going to roll. Let's see. Or I could pick somebody who hasn't said anything yet. You haven't said anything today. You haven't said anything today. Uh, so it's 1 to 10, 11 through 20. What's war good for? If you say absolutely nothing, I'm going to ask you to go on beyond that. Eleven. What is war good for? If you're not sure, I suggest you say, I don't know, but my best guess is. Daisy, you there? Are you awake? Okay, please answer the question. Do you know the question? Would you like me to restate it? I can answer for her. I appreciate that. I will come back to you, Miss Birmingham. You'll be asked. The second question after this, there'll be one other. I do expect you to try your best at that point. Yes, please. Um, and thank you for your comments. Yeah, of course. Um, war, it's controversial, of course, but it is good in a way where we're now free from Britain. We're in our own separate country, and we have the governments and things established that we do now. War has brought us freedom. War has stopped oppression. If we're faced with an overwhelming enemy, if the Chinese army marched in, or if the American government went rogue and decided to oppress us, we could accept it or we could fight. Fighting is horrible. War is hellish, hellacious, horrific, other H words. But it's better than slavery. At least many people have calculated that it was better than slavery throughout the years. The opposite of war often is not peace, it's often surrender. And as, 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 as terrible a, uh, a, a thing as, as that is, as terrible a thought as that is, um, there are worse things than war. Uh, the Holocaust. Um, there are others. So... Any other thoughts on the whole war thing? What about in Heat, in the second film? 
how is conflict played out in heat? That would be you, sir. Um, so the men just talk it over mm -hmm. instead of screaming or whatever. Um, like civilized people, and they come to the agreement that hey, I kind of don't want to take you in, but like I'll just try not to come across you again. <laughs> That's what they say on the surface. Do you think it's as relaxed in reality as it seemed on the surface, sort of casual and calm? Probably not, no. When he was first pulled over, the first thing the criminal does is make sure that his sidearm is free. The police officer is holding his sidearm, ready to go. These are both incredibly dangerous men, and they know that. They understand that about one another and about themselves. So violence is always there. But you're right. They have a casual conversation about um, about what they're, what's at stake. And what's at stake are their roles. One's a police officer, an inspector at the top of his game. One is a uh, criminal, a bank robber, which is the king of all criminals. In prison, there's an aristocracy of crime. People at the bottom are child molesters, which everyone hates and tortures. The people at the top are bank robbers, successful bank robbers particularly, because they are smarter than everyone else. Anyone that can successfully rob a bank or two before they're caught is going to be very, very smart. And also, as criminals, very vicious and amoral. And criminals respect that. They respect viciousness. They respect amorality. So uh, the conflict is, on the, is in the form of words, but there's always the threat of violence. Okay, uh, so was there any distraction, Daisy, was there any distraction during that conversation in the cafe? Were the two men, were any of them thinking about other things? Were they looking away? Was there any distraction, yes or no? I'll talk to you at the end of class. I don't understand what's going on. I'm sorry if I've made things worse. I'll talk to you at the end of class. Okay. That same question to anyone, please. Do you? Uh, can you repeat the question? The question is, was there any distraction? Were the men paying attention to anything but each other? I mean, yeah, I think they were looking around, seeing if there were any other men around. Them. They were aware. Yes, you're right, of their circumstances. But what was going on between them in that conversation? Well, I mean, I think that what they were saying to each other and what they were thinking about each other were quite different. So I think you could argue that they're being distracted by how they really feel about the other person. So it's making it... They were being of two minds, yes. Yeah. There was a certain schizophrenia in the way they're talking. They're talking about bull barbecues and ball games on the surface. But what's really going on is psychology, psychological combat. It's a, it's a Mexican standoff. Because what they're looking at, they know that they're going to be squaring off against one another. They know that they're in this life or death competition with one another. They know that the police officer has chosen to make it a life or death competition. The criminal just wants to succeed at his crime, but he realizes he's dealing with this, this tireless, pitiless figure that's following him. So what they're looking for is any sign of mental weakness. They're looking for any sign of psychological or mental weakness. So the conversation is very superficial, very on the surface, but it does deal with some real things. And then the cop tries to get the criminal angry by saying, you know, if it's between you and some slob that you're going to turn, uh, make his wife into a widow, his children into orphans, uh, brother, you are going down. And that, that is much more that, you know, that there's, there's blah, 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 blah. I'm going to get you sucker. I'm going to get you. And that's a challenge. And the other guy, he didn't lose it. He didn't get all emotional. He didn't get all, Bleh. he just, he, 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 he thought about it. He, calmed himself down, he chose his words, but he had never, he had, at no point lost track of the other guy. And he said, well, think there's another side to that coin. What if you're standing between me and what I want? Because I won't let you do that. 
nothing will stop me. If I, yeah, we've been, we've been here face to face, but if I need to, basically, he says, I'll kill you. So both of them are playing this psychological game. Why? Because we live in civilization. Because the jungle that we are in is not so simple. The survival of the fittest that plays out in the wilderness is a game of bodies. An eagle spots a rabbit, dives on the rabbit, stoops on the rabbit, grabs the rabbit, or doesn't. Either the rabbit escapes the eagle, or the eagle grabs the rabbit and drops it from a high height, or rips it apart with its talons and beak, and eats the rabbit. The rabbit either lives or dies. In our society, we do a lot of conflict. But most of our conflict doesn't involve firearms or clubs or fisticuffs. Most of it is psychological. Most of it is played out through the rules that we have of civilization. Okay, think about all the conflicts of wills that you've encountered over the years. Most of them don't end up with people slamming one another wildly. Most of them are dealt with verbally. And that is a quality also of how far we've come. That's a product of our culture and civilization. So if you've seen these two film clips, what you have done is you've got the before picture, humanity in a state of savagery. If you don't believe in the theory of evolution, fine, that's okay. Picture modern human beings running around in a complete state of nature, just figuring out life. And it's the same thing. We go from there, utter primitivism in a completely natural world, to now where we live in an artificial world of physicality and an artificial world of roles and conflicts that all play out or mostly play out in very civilized ways. Any thoughts? I just think it's nice to show a beginning and an ending picture before we go deeper into the history. Now, those of you at home, I'm going to be signing off momentarily. You can use the rest of the period to get some productive work done because the people here are going to be taking quiz 12. You guys are going to be taking quiz 12 tomorrow. So uh, for now, I'll say a uh, ta ta to those of you at home. And for those of you who are here, please take everything, put it off your desks, uh, take any risks.